that if uh, when he's introducing people or before he's done, just to ask if there's any trackers in the group uh, and ask them to kindly leave if they don't have permission to be here. So I would ask that you do that from now on. We had a young lady that just left. Um, that's not appropriate, nor is it appropriate for us to do it at the Democrats. Sorry, what is a tracker? A tracker will come in and videotape everything and then use it against whoever. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. So, and it works both ways. I mean, you know, we have people too, and if they're asked to leave according to the rules, they will leave, but you need to ask them. So I'd suggest you do that. A um, couple of things I want to tell you. First of all, as of uh, Monday, uh, I resigned from the GOP state party. Um, as an Area 3 Vice Chair, so I wanted to, you to, to know that, and the reason for that is uh, our guest speaker, and I'll just give you a little indication. The bylaws in our state party, the GOP state party, says that if you are going to declare or endorse a candidate, uh, you must step down, that you can't, as a uh, chairman of a committee, or certainly as a state member, uh, you need to step down, so I chose to do that. We all sacrifice things in our life, for different reasons. Um, I feel very strongly that this was easy for me to do, um, to sacrifice uh, this opportunity to um, work for the next governor of the state of New Hampshire. Uh, Ovid is someone I've known for a few years now, and um, he is, as I've said in the past, to the real deal. He will not give you an answer just because you expect that answer or because that's the answer you want. Uh, he has a high integrity level. He's very honest. Uh, he's somebody that you can get to know very easily. He's engaging, and um, I'm very proud to be uh, part of this team. So, without further ado, over to Monte. Well, thank you very much. It's great to be with you this evening, and. Uh, uh, I'm really, first of all, thank you, Patrick, for continuing to lead this great group. And uh, to JP, um, you know, I'm really honored that JP would take the initiative to step down in order to help me. We've asked him to, as a volunteer, to help coordinate our field. Um, right now, and I'll give you more of the background and so forth, but right now we've got a volunteer effort. Uh, until the presidential primary is over, and, and on January 10th, we decided to hold off on hiring staff formally and to see who's available afterwards uh, to be part of our team. And it's also in deference to the presidential primary because it really is the, 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 main, uh, the main event right now in New Hampshire. Uh, making sure that we send a message from New Hampshire uh, as to who the most conservative candidate who can win is for the rest of the country. That's our message. That's our work, I think, that we need to send out. So I want to make sure we focus on that. So I'm grateful to JP and his wife Donna for helping, being willing to help us out in the center of a period when we bring volunteers together quietly, organize our, our field organizations so that we can launch after the presidential term is over uh, in a full fledged campaign. And then, Mark, excuse me. That's okay. <laughs> and to the two Democrats in the room or any other Democrats, independents, whatever, I'm happy to have you here. I usually don't mind having trackers come because after a while, the trackers come two or three times. We start to reconsider the position as trackers for the Democratic Party. We <laughs> start <laughs> saying, you know what, you're not as crazy as I thought you were. <laughs> Your ideas are not as bad as I thought they were either. And uh, I usually like that. That conversion experience is a very positive one, and it happens all the time. Um, I'm a fourth generation Hampshire native, the son of Hampshire farmers, mill workers, and dentists. And I like to say, if I, growing up a dentist's son doesn't build character, growing up a name like Ovid does. <laughs> name in politics, and I'm proud to carry it, but I also recognize the difficulty. Most candidates worry about name recognition, I worry about name pronunciation, because people don't know this. Uh, I've uh, been impressed when I've had a chance to speak to this group by the sort of the dedication and commitments of the citizens here who come as part of this committee. It's a relatively new committee, uh, you have a lot of great energy, and you obviously network well, and that's what we need as a party. I really want to encourage you to continue to invite people to be part of the team, uh, to be part of the dialogue that you take that happens here with the fellowship and the discussions that you all have. Um, because we need to continue to build our party and be and continue to invite people to our cause. I think most New Hampshire people, when you go down the issues that we stand for, are with us. Uh, they may not know it, 
They may not understand sort of the rationale for why we believe what we do. Uh, but when they understand that the fundamental premise is that we believe that we, each one of us, is endowed by our Creator with an inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, and that the consent of the government is what gives rise to government. That we are the bosses, and that government is supposed to serve us, not rule us. We can start to have a conversation with those people, with all people, because all Americans, Democrats, Libertarians, Vegetarians, Republicans, we all believe this, don't we? That we are not here given rights by government, we are here given rights by God or by our Creator, whoever you believe is your Creator. And that government has only those rights or powers which we granted through our consent. And it's high time the people of America take their rightful place as the rulers of government and make sure government is our servant to do what it's supposed to do under the Constitution. Yeah. Now, when I ran for the U.S. Senate last year, and by the way, we had some great events uh, in this part of the state. I think, I don't know if you remember, we were at uh, Dan Donovan's uh, facility. Yeah. Um, uh, this was about, I guess it would have been like August, or maybe end of July of 2010, and Kelly Ayotte and I were there together. Yeah. And it was a very robust conversation, wasn't it? We didn't debate each other, but there was a lot of energy there. I remember that distinctly. I think my poll numbers were like 3%, maybe 4%. And all of a sudden, they started peaking shortly after that. <clears throat> to the point where we came in within one percentage of winning that primary. And we did it the old-fashioned way. I didn't have a lot of money to spend. I had enough to be viable. But it was people like you all who were willing to spread the word about my campaign, about what I stood for, about what you thought you saw. And, um, and when the results were in, we were with, with that at one percentage point, I said to my wife, Betty, you know what, there's only six weeks between now and the general election. We've got to get behind Kelly to make sure Paul Holmes is not the United States Senator from New Hampshire. And I'm proud to call Kelly A. Off my U.S. Senator. Yeah, yeah. Mistakes about it. I didn't do it because I just wanted to be, you know, a part, good to the party. I did it because it was the right thing to do, frankly. And I'm glad we did. And so people say to me, well, you're running for governor now. What's that about? Let me tell you what it's about. It's about the same thing. It's the other side of the coin. I was running for U.S. Senate to go to Washington to start pushing the federal government back into the four corners of the Constitution, to start working to balance our federal budget, to start looking at doing things that would improve the quality of life for people of this country and for our states, not by more government, but by less government. You may recall I was uh, the only candidate who unabashedly say we should, said we should eliminate the U.S. Department of Education. It does not do what the people who founded it thought it would do. It hasn't helped education. It's taken more power and control away from the local citizens and the states who should be operating elementary and secondary education. And so I'm running for governor to achieve the same thing, but from the other side, which is on the state perspective. If we want to save this country, we need leaders at the state level who are willing to say to Uncle Sam very clearly and unapologetically, get out of the classroom, get out of the operating room, get out of the boardroom of our state. We don't need you telling us how to run a business. That's not your role. We don't need you to tell us how to teach our kids. That's not your role. And you know what? When it comes to treating our citizens in health care, stop Obamacare, get back into the four corners of the Constitution, and we'll take care of our own. Thank you very much. It's the only way we're going to see the, the realignment of power out of Washington back to the states and the people. We need people in Washington to do it, but we need people at the state level who are not afraid to say, you're wrong, Uncle Sam, to try to impose a one-size-fits-all health care program. And so if I'm elected governor, the first thing I will do is tell the Attorney General, join the other states, and sue the federal government on Obamacare. We cannot afford to let health care be taken over by Washington. And if the Attorney General, who was appointed by Governor Lynch, says, no, I won't do it, I'll do it myself. Under the United States, under the New Hampshire Constitution, I have the power, I'll have the power as the governor to bring an action on behalf of the people of the state of New Hampshire in this respect. And beyond that, 
I think we need to demand of the federal government to peel back the rules and regulations that are choking the delivery of health care in our state. It's, it's unwieldy. It's micromanagement under Medicare and Medicaid. Let's get block grants into the state for purposes of ensuring the lives of our senior citizens, providing the care and coverage that they were promised in, under Medicare, but let us do it ourselves. And so, as the governor, I want to be clear with you that I'm going to be the people's advocate and the state's advocate when it comes to Washington. But I'll also be the people's advocate and the state's uh, and the advocate of the state of New Hampshire when it comes to governing within our state. I think it's important that we have a governor who's hands-on. And that means a governor who's willing to work with the legislature on legislative initiatives to evaluate the merits of any bill and to, and to make sure that in terms of leadership, the governor weighs in. The Constitution of New Hampshire allows a governor to sit back and let, and let a piece of legislation be passed without his signature and be made into law. I'm going to commit to you that I'll either sign or veto every piece of legislation that comes to my desk, which will guarantee that I pay attention to the legislative process, that I let the legislative leaders know, even if they're Republican leaders, if I don't agree with the direction we're taking, or I don't agree with something in the bill, so they know if you pass it, I'll see to sign it or veto it. And I'll let the people know that I'm going to be engaged. And I use this as an example of Governor Lynch's past session. I know Governor Lynch, and I like some of the things he does in terms of bringing <coughs> people together and, re and responding to crisis. But he needed to be a leader in the area of budgeting, for example. He submitted a budget to the legislature. The legislature redid the budget. Uh, he wasn't involved in that process, not because they foreclosed it. He just didn't participate. Then the budget submitted to him, and he criticizes it up and down. And what does he do? He lets it go. He lets it be enacted without a signature. That's not leadership. He had to have backbones. If he didn't agree with that budget, he needed to say, "I'm going to veto it and send it back to the legislature." He didn't do that. That's not leadership. That's not leadership. And I think the people in the Hampshire deserve that. Uh, I want to. I want you to know that uh, I'm probably the most experienced, if you will, candidate for governor in a long time. And I, this is why, what I want you to know about me. Um, not only am I a New Hampshire native, but I've been, I've been um, involved in, in the governmental sector as legal counsel to the state senate. In 1991, I served there. I know the legislative process as the lawyer to the senate. That's like having a rain seat to a heavyweight <laughs> fight. You're not in the rain, but you're as close as you possibly can get on that ringside seat. I also served as chairman of the State Board of Education between 1993 and 1996. I know the executive branch, how it works, and the rules and regulations, how they're made. Um, and just so you know where I was in my thinking back then, um, you may recall that the federal government passed what I call education stimulus money in the form of Goals 2000. That was the Clinton administration's version of how Washington can help us teach our kids better. So you know what I did? As chairman of the State Board of Education, I got the majority vote our board to say, no to Uncle Sam, no thank you, we don't want you to do more with our schools, we don't want that money. That drove the education bureaucracy crazy. <laughs> how could you turn money down? I, I said, you know how we're going to turn money down? We're going to say, no, we don't want more oversight of Washington. We don't want, want more strings attached. I was ready to say it then. And then I went to Washington and actually testified in Congress saying, we should, you should eliminate the U.S. Department of Education and block grant dollars back to the state when it comes to special education and any other programs that we become involved or dependent on so we can wean ourselves off of the money. And during the Senate race, um, a woman, in, uh, I was in Atkinson at a little store, and this woman came up to me and she had white eyes and she grabbed my hand and she said, you're over the line saying. I said, yes, I am. She says, you know, I remember when you were State Board of Education Chairman. I said, oh, that's wonderful. That was a long time ago. She said, you know, you used to say we should eliminate the Department of Education. I said, wow, you were paying attention, weren't you? She said, I thought you were crazy. She says, now I know you're right, and that's why I'm going to vote for you. I'm an independent, but I'm going to vote for you because we have gotten out of control in Washington. I said, you are right, man. Thank you for coming to that point of view. Uh, and so I was willing to take those positions back then. I ran for governor in 1996 at the age of 38, and I was a long shot and won the Republican primary in a year that was not cool to be conservative. 1996, Bob Dole and I didn't do very well. <laughs> not in the air. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, 
So I went back to, the, to my practicing law, raising my family. My daughters were 10 and 8 years old. And I said, my wife and I decided it's time to focus on the family. And so I also wanted to focus on the community. So I got involved with the Boy Scouts. I've been president of the Dan Robson Council, our Boy Scout organization in New Hampshire, uh, for three and a half years. I got involved with St. Mary's Bank, my first credit union in the country to learn about finan the financial system in New Hampshire, particularly for small businesses. And I was chairman of the board there for three years. I became involved with CASA, Court Appointed Special Advocates. The East Cecile's board and our wife, my wife and I continued to work uh, to advocate for a foster son who was with us, uh, who came to us when he was two years old, he's 23 years old now, he's a special needs young man. And so we've dealt with that part of our, our, our system in New Hampshire, our delivery system. So I come to you, and I'm a business lawyer, I represent businesses, both for-profit, not-for-profit. I've dealt with a number of really exotic sort of issues. And I've worked with people across the state in a number of different ways. So I bring governmental experience, private sector experience. I'm an owner of a large law firm and been a manager of the firm. <coughs> and I bring you also civic and charitable experience. And uh, when I come to, when I go to, if I become governor of New Hampshire, I will be committed to networking with the people of the state, bring people together and bring, bring solutions to, to us, and then be innovative about reforming state government. I think we have to be committed to renewing the New Hampshire advantage so that our state's the best state in which to work and live and raise a family, bar none. We're pretty good, but we can do so much better. We can do so much better. We have uh, antiquated legislative processes now in the Concord that date back for decades about how we do budgeting. We need to modernize our budgeting process. We need to find ways of reducing regulations, not increasing them. So one of the second, probably the second thing I'll do is issue an executive order to put a moratorium on all rules for at least 90 days so we can figure out what are the rules that are coming forward and then get our agencies in on the work of repealing the rules. A lot of rules that are outdated, they're, they're out of control. We need to find a way to reduce rulemaking. I like to be known as the governor who reduced the regulatory structure in New Hampshire for families and businesses uh, and to save our people. We trust you first. We all think the government needs to be everywhere in their lives. Um, and in the, on the business side, let me just say this. You won't have to worry about electing a supermajority in the legislature in order to make New Hampshire a standout state because I'll sign right to work. I'll advocate for right to work. <laughs> this is an important issue. I think it's an issue of principle that says to our businesses and Businesses around the country and around the world, and we're open for business in New Hampshire. We allow employee freedom of choice. We allow people to make the decision about where they, who they affiliate with and who they organize with. And we allow people to work in a place that otherwise might be unionized, but if they don't want to be part of it, they can choose not to be. Um, there are a lot of a number of initiatives that I could talk about, but I'd like to maybe open up the <coughs> questions and answers. I, I, um, here to tell you that I also want you to know that I want to be a governor who's known as the people's governor. I'm a lifelong conservative Republican, and yes, I am conservative. Uh, but as the governor of the state, I'll leave my party label at the state house door, I'll go into the governor's office and be the people's governor. And if you want access, if you're a Democrat or an independent, libertarian, or a vegetarian, or a <laughs> come on in and offer your solutions, and we'll work together. And we're not going to agree on all issues. In fact, we probably won't agree on all issues here. But if you're 70, 80 percent with me, we're together. Ronald Reagan said, "My 20 percent, the person who's 20 percent opposed me on the, on the issues isn't my 20 percent enemy. Somebody I might disagree with on 20 percent of the issues, but for the most part, we're together and getting the work done for New Hampshire. And that's the kind of government I want to be available, accessible, and an advocate for what is good and right about." our state and our country. So thank you very much for being uh, giving me the time to speak here tonight. I hope I can earn your support. Our website is over 2012 that's O-V-I-D-E 2012.com. Joyce has a bumper sticker. She said it was uh, in the center. So we're going to get send out new bumper stickers. <laughs> that will easily fit over your old center. <laughs> <laughs> and so you don't have to you know, feel off the paint. <laughs> I'm honored that my bumper sticker was your first bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, and so, Friends of Ovid, 2012.com also gets you to our website. You can make contributions there. You can sign up there. Let us send in questions. Let us know what you think. And let's develop a team. And I, I'll, I'll commit this to you. If you're part of our team, we're going to keep that team together after the election. Too often, campaigns are organized. Uh, and then after the election, the candidate forgets you. The staff forgets who's out there. I want to maintain that relationship with the people around New Hampshire who helped me to become governor so you can help me serve. That is getting information back to me or being my eyes and ears in your communities where there are issues invari invariably that will come up. And, uh, and with the internet the way it is, there's no excuse why we can't be in a relationship with one another after the campaign. And I'm committed to do that with you. So again, thank you very much.
they may be disappointed with the result, but at least they feel like they've been heard. And that's part of our process. It takes time, it takes patience, and it takes a fair amount of, uh, you know, I don't want to say tolerance as much as, as a willingness to be present and take the heat and try to process and work with people so they are heard and you do the very best you can. Uh, it's not called compromising. I, in fact, I read today, it was it Thomas Sowell, somebody said, the trick for Republicans and conservatives is to try to lead people to the issues that we stand for and the values we believe in, not to, not to undermine them or leave them behind for the sake of simply compromising. And I think there is a distinction there. So that's what I'm going to try to do. And I've, I've been fortunate to have a good experience with people who don't agree with me on a lot of, a lot of issues, but to be able to still work with them. The question is, do I have any thoughts on the Northern Pass project? Well, let me try this on you. The analysis. I, I see this as a two-part question, uh, or two-part answer. The first question is, uh, do we have something philosophical? Is there an issue of principle that would say to us as a state, we don't want to be the gateway for hydroelectric power generated in Canada that would enter into the Northeast grid? Is there something fundamentally wrong with that? The answer in my mind is no, not theoretically. In the theoretical model, that's clean energy. Uh, it gives us a source of energy to, into New Hampshire. I would say this, that whatever ends up with Northern Pass, we should have a right of first refusal as a state to that power. If everything else fa failed, our generating capacity, uh, Seabrook, uh, and if we weren't getting power here, we'd be able to take the power coming into us from Canada. So that's the first question in my mind. I've raised that question in the North Country, and some people have said to me, yeah, we're absolutely opposed to the idea of taking foreign energy in Canada. And I say, okay, I, I can hear you say that, but I, I, can't, I can't see why, because it's there, it's generated, let's, let's, let's bring it to the The second thing, then, the second question is, what's the mode of transmission? And if the mode of transmission is such that we, we've got to exercise eminent domain power to take a uh, property rights away from citizens, I don't support that. If the mode of transmission requires us to take the lines through uh, existing right-of-ways, where there may be already some develop some, some uh, power lines there, are some openings, uh, and then we're not going uh, to face our natural beauty, then I'd say fine. And I'm not sure what the route is going to be. And ideally, you can you know, lay some of this power on the ground, through, apparently they've done that in other parts of the world, um, so hopefully the promoters of Northern Pass are going to come up with a plan that people can set. So I think we need to look at it from a two-part perspective. Uh, I think that uh, securing New Hampshire's energy future is important to us. Uh, and I think the way to avoid having New Hampshire be part of a national decline if this Obama administration were to continue is by making sure we're not part of the decline. We stand independently when it comes to energy, comes to our natural resources, when it comes to our economy. And we need to look at ourselves that way. I think all the states really do need to look at themselves that way, too. Were we going to get any electricity out of that? We, uh, it sounded more like we that we were going to be the conduit for it to go to, to right. Massachusetts. And well, well that's, that's, what, uh, that's what I'm telling you. Is I'm, uh, if I'm the governor at the time this comes through, uh, I won't be in favor of it unless I know we can negotiate a right of first refusal that says, if everything else is working, it doesn't matter where it goes. But if things fail, I want that power for us first, before it goes anywhere else. And it comes right into New Hampshire. You know, it'll be trans, trans, the transmission station, I think, will be in Deerfield, is what they're talking about. Um, we can we <coughs> be able to access that first. I thought you said Frank. Oh, well, it comes to Franklin and then ends up in Deerfield for, I'm not sure what the, what the mechanism is, but it's what DC power, uh, AC power coming in, it becomes DC power or vice versa. Uh, I've got to get the details on that. But it's Franklin benefits there and then also Deerfield is another point of connection. Yes, sir. When you talk about having, uh, New Hampshire having access to this power, aren't we part of the same grid that that power would flow into? We are, but apparently I mean, we've we've drawn from that grid before in times of uh, what well, we draw probably outright in terms of uh, peak. We do, and we do it. And my understanding is that you 
negotiate with the power company as part of the package of purchase, a power purchase agreement, which allows us to draw in from the grid the power that comes in uh, first. And apparently there's a way to do that. So we need to make sure we have that, that security. Because that should be one of the benefits of being the conduit, right? That we can have a uh, right of first refusal on that power. And, and it's got to be able to be done. I mean, this, this is not the first time a state has asked for that. Yes, sir. Um, the gentleman here on my left of the head of me made an excellent point a few minutes yes. ago uh, describing the poisonous atmosphere uh, between ends of the political scale. And it's, it's certainly been described that way in the uh, natural legislature at present. It's absolutely awful. It's been described to me, and I'm not an insider anyway. I've known you enough over the years to know that you're a very a nice person and have good people skills. Uh, if you're uh, elected uh, to the governorship, uh, how, how are you going to resolve as as a person who is in a position to do that? How are you going to resolve this poisonous atmosphere that's crippling our state at the present? Um, that's a very good question. Did everybody hear that question? Yeah, yeah I've heard that's that. That's not really answer for it, yeah. too. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think that it's a, it's a very appropriate question. And, and one of the I think one of the things we're seeing as a, as a manifestation is a lack of leadership. You have a brand new you know, group of legislators who were sent to Concord, both in the House and the Senate, uh, who feel they have a mandate for reform and change. You have a Democratic governor who doesn't agree with a lot of the policies and so forth, and they're, he's not working with the legislative leaders. Maybe they try to work it, but they're not able to communicate. Um, I would submit to you that if I'm there with them, whoever's there in, the, in leadership, we're going to sit down and we're going to have an understanding about how we behave ourselves. And as far as I'm concerned, the way we conduct business in Concord is as important as the results of what that business is. We need to instill faith in the people that we have a plan, an approach that's orderly. Let's agree to disagree respectfully, and there's a way to do it. And I will be uh, calling people quietly to the table if we have issues about that. Because right now, I think what you're seeing is, a, a, you know, leadership abhors a void. And there's been a void of leadership in Congress. And uh, the people being sent there uh, are trying to fill that void. That's what they feel they should need to do. And uh, the governor can exercise a lot of influence over how the legislature functions, how government functions. And when I was uh, chair of the State Board of Education, I saw that with Governor Merrill. Uh, he was very involved with the legislative leaders. A lot of it was behind the scenes. He, he allowed a lot of venting to, hap to happen behind closed doors so that in the public square, right. there was order to it. There was a rationale to it. There may have been disagreement, but it was respectful. And that's what we need. Yes? Uh, well, just as a follow-up question. Uh, can, we have, can we have your impressions uh, on the light of what you just said uh, on that uh, appalling spectacle at the ballot law commission a couple of weeks ago? I mean, which... Yeah, in my view, you take some serious reflection on where we're headed. Well, again, there you get people expressing frustration, and uh, uh, I think we again need to make sure that we ask our colleagues to behave themselves in a way that is respectful and worthy of public service. And I'll, I'll leave it at that. I believe in decorum. I believe that there's a way to behave. And we've become a coarse society. Let, let's let, forget, forget elected officials. Let's talk about our society as a whole. Mm -hmm. Look at what you, what you see when you go now to, 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 to this downtown, to your own villages and communities. People become coarse with each other, rude. Uh, we need to bring back manners and behavior. That's why yeah, I'm so strong at scouting. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, we need more scouts out there to understand. challenged me to the four-point test, <laughs> and then he gave me this coin and he said, promise me you'll carry this on your campaign, this is for the U.S. Senate. I get such Catholic guilt, I continue to carry this <laughs> But I believe in the principle of the four-point test. So, so we need to, to you know, raise 
the standard of the bar for behavior. Recognizing that we're not always going to behave exactly what we should, but that is very important. And that should be the New Hampshire you know, model that we send out to the rest of the country. We know how to agree or disagree respectfully. We're passionate, we have different views, we've got to work together. Because in the end, that's the only way we're going to make this state a better place for our children and our grandchildren. Put your own personal issues aside, focus on the merits. Yes, sir. Yeah, oh, but uh, there's a lot of people on both in both parties that see uh, expanded gambling in the state as the yes. financial salvation for the state. <laughs> right. uh, I was just wondering if you could uh, tell us your views on expanded okay. gambling. I, uh, I'm not a gambler. Never been one. Uh, I, I'm not a fan of gambling. I just don't see. I don't. I don't understand what the attraction is. So I'll just, that's my disclaimer. Uh, secondly, I absolutely refuse to take more money out of the private sector, whether it's through taxation or gambling revenues, to feed government. The problem here in New Hampshire and in Washington isn't a lack of revenue. It's the spending that's out of control and the systems that are inefficient. We've got to keep putting pressure on ourselves to find new, better, and less expensive ways of delivering services. So I, I do not believe that we should agree to expand gambling for the sake of taking money. That's just not, a, a, that, that does not move the needle for me in favor of that. Thirdly, people say, oh, we have to, we have to agree to casino gambling in New Hampshire because they're doing it in Massachusetts. Since when did New Hampshire people <laughs> decide to do something that's Massachusetts doing? Right? No, you know, they have broad-based taxes. We're not going to have a broad-based tax, not even my watch. So that's not a reason for doing it. People say, well, you know, our citizens go to Massachusetts to gamble. Yeah, they go to Massachusetts to watch the Red Sox, to go to the you know, concerts, to go to the Patriots game. That's, that's fine. I, I'm not competing for that. Um, and then, and then third, fourthly, I think there is a quality of life issue. And, um, and that, that is a serious issue. The nature is special in a lot of ways, and one of the ways we're special is we do have a very family-friendly environment here, and natural resources, and, and I think the whole gambling operation takes away from that. So, I would say to you that the presumption in my book is against expanded gambling. Somebody would have to make a very strong and powerful case that this, the benefits far away the negatives, and I haven't heard that case. Yes. I can't believe, living in New Hampshire, that I had to travel to Maine to go to a Cabela's, or to Massachusetts <laughs> to go to a Bass Pro Shop. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> Cabela's was going to move to, to Hooks. I know. Huh? What can we do to get more businesses like that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the holdup was that. What, what, was, if it was a local planning issue, I think there was some planning problems. We should try to be, we should be a magnet for companies like Cabela's to expand here. Although I do want manufacturing to be in New Hampshire. Okay. I mean, uh, I think our largest employer technically is like Walmart, which is a good business, a good company, but they sell products. They don't manufacture goods and services here. So it's a, we, need a, we need a diverse economy, one that has magnets like a Cabela's that bring people here, and, you know, shopping malls and all. We also need manufacturing in New Hampshire. We need to uh, have the high quality services and research and development in terms of medical supplies and medical technology. Uh, so, uh, I would, what I would do as governor is put together the best and the brightest, including private sector as well as state government, to develop a statewide economic development plan. We don't have a comprehensive economic development plan. We haven't really sat down and looked at of the assets of our state, what are the potentials for bringing new businesses there, what are the potentials for expanding some of the existing businesses, and working in a concerted way to you know, leverage our resources. And if bringing our Cabela's in is going to be part of that <coughs> mix, we can see that. And we can see the spin-off businesses that flow from it. So uh, I'd like to, I, I agree with you. I'm a hundred fisherman, and I'd love to have a Cabela's in their body. Rather than put it in mail order. I do have some Cabela's products in mail order. <laughs> any other questions? Well, I want to thank you again for, for, for being such a uh, so it's good to have your phone to spend some time here. And uh, please join our team. I need your help. We're going to do this the old-fashioned way, one voter at a time. And if you want to talk to JP, it's going to... I have some sign-up sheets if you're interested in joining us. <coughs> um, there's some cards here for them. And